Good evening. I'm Sarah Saltzman, Director of Events at the Holocaust Memorial Center. I would like to welcome everyone to tonight's program. A special thank you to our museum members who are watching. We truly appreciate your support. Thank you also to our community partners, the Greater Farmington Film Festival and the Detroit Jewish Film Festival. This evening's discussion is about the film, A Call to Spy, and the beginning of World War II with Britain becoming desperate. Winston Churchill orders his spy agency to recruit and train an army of female spies to help undermine the Nazi regime in France. This film, inspired by true stories of resilient women, left a legacy most appropriate to discuss tonight, March 1st, the beginning of Women's History Month. I would now like to introduce tonight's special guests. Our moderator, Nancy Kaffer, is an award-winning columnist and a member of the editorial board at the Detroit Free Press. Craig Grayley is a former senior intelligence officer with the CIA and the author of Hall of Mirrors, Virginia Hall, America's Greatest Spy of World War II. And finally, Sarah Megan Thomas, the star of the movie Call to Spy. She wrote the original screenplay and produced the film. Welcome to everyone. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. And thanks, Sarah and Craig, and to all of you who are joining us tonight. I think this is going to be, I'm really looking forward to talking to you guys because I've seen the movie. I read the book. I have so many questions about this fascinating woman and the creative journey each of you guys took to bring her story to life. Um, so I guess what I'd love to start off by asking is, how did you find Virginia story? How did you find her story? Why did, what made you want to, to start writing about her? Um, Craig, do you want to start? Sure. I, I uh, had uh, just retired from the agency, uh, CIA, and uh, I um, was working part-time in the history staff as a, as a consultant. And it came across Virginia Hall's story. At the same time, I was also uh, going back to school to get a master's in writing from Hopkins, and I needed a thesis topic. Um, now, with the agency, Virginia Hall is an icon, but outside of the agency, uh, not too many people knew about her. And in fact, in the agency, not too many people knew about the details about Virginia Hall either. So I started working on Virginia Hall's story, and uh, my thesis advisor said, hey, uh, I've never heard of it before. Let's, let's start working on a book. And I said, sure. And uh, it, my thesis project turned into my, into my work, and it, it, uh, it, it was a labor of love because uh, Virginia Hall's story is just so amazing. And it's really one of those undertold stories that really needed to be out in the public and, and in the public eye. Sarah, how about you? Um, well, for me, you know, as a filmmaker, I actually, uh, believe it or not, actually start with the genre um, that I think it will make my investors their money back as a profitable genre. And then I look at it from a female lens and an independent film lens of what stories are missing. So um, just an example of that is my previous film, Equity, was kind of the first female-driven Wall Street movie. So, so with this um, movie, A Call to Spy, I knew I wanted the spy genre. Like I love James Bond movies, but the women, you know, they're fun, but they're not really um, good at their job <laughs> in my view. So anyway, um, you know, I'd studied World War II extensively at Williams College. I knew about Churchill's secret army and that was really where the research started. Um, and then as I uncovered these 39 women in F section, Virginia Hall was one of them. I chose three women, um, Virginia, Vera and Nora, because they were pioneers in their field, like the first, first female field agent, first female wireless, first and only female spy recruiter. And I thought putting them together in one film, because they were from different nationalities and religions and united to resist against this kind of common evil, would allow for a kind of a broader conversation than say a biopic of just Virginia Hall or just Vera. 
So Sarah, you had to choose, and you kind of touched on this a little in your in your last answer. You had to choose which moments to use to illustrate the story. Obviously, you could have made like 70 million hours of movie about her remarkable life. How did you choose which moments to uh, to really just dry, you know, the the core story of who she was and what happened? Well, who all three of those women were? That's a great question. And that was like the epic challenge of this particular movie. You have a two hour medium. Um, you don't have the length of a book to kind of try and encapsulate um, her life in, in a fair way, because that was really important to me as, as the first film from all these women. Um, so what I tried to do is basically stay true. Well, first of all, like four years of research went into the project. So everything was heavily researched. But then at the end of the day, you almost have to put that research aside and have structure and plot. So I try to stay true to the arc of what happens to everyone in the film. Just, just one example is that, you know, Virginia, as Craig can get into in more detail, um, better than me probably, is very famous for a prison break. And um, the way she broke prisoners out of prison could be an entire movie in and of itself. We didn't have the real estate for that in this movie. So there is a prison break. It's totally different from how she did it. It's related to the larger plot of the movie. But the one thing I did do is, you know, SOE agents did use Monopoly as a tool to break um, agents out. So I took a little fact from here, put it here, took a little fact from here, put it here, um, trying to stay true to the arc of who they are as individuals, which was important not to lose. You know, the question about the Monopoly game was actually on my list because when my husband and I watched the movie, he said, you have to ask if they really used Monopoly games to smuggle in uh, tools to break out with. So I'll be happy to, to know that, yes, that is that is actually, wow, what a, what, a, what a rich detail of how these things happen. Well, actually, one of my interns researched all the ways on how, you know, agents were broken out. And one of them that was in the script for a long time and is not in the movie was like they had bread and they put the dough in the lock and they took the dough out and they, <laughs> done, they cut a key and everyone wow. in the script was like that that couldn't have happened we don't believe it i'm like but it <laughs> did <laughs> Well, you know, they do say truth is stranger than fiction. I, I think I've heard that saying before. So um, both of you uh, had, obviously, so Craig, you, you wrote a book about a historical character, but in the first person. And right. Sarah, you played her. Um, and I'm going to ask each of you about why you felt drawn to do that. Craig, do you want to start? Sure, sure. I'd be glad to. Um, all of the information about Virginia Hall was basically with government uh, documents. Uh, Virginia Hall was what they call a true spy. I mean, she took her, her uh, oath of secrecy very seriously. And even after the war, she didn't write a memoir. She gave no interviews. And, uh, you know, she even talked very little about her, her life overseas as a, as a spy to her closest relatives and family members. So there really wasn't too much in the way of Virginia's interior, uh, how, her personality, how she felt about having a prosthetic leg. And I took a look at my experience uh, with CIA and, you know, I've been in war zones where I've seen women agents in action. Uh, you know, I talked to a psychiat psychiatrist who, uh, an agency psychiatrist who was in, uh, you know, specialized in, in traumas like Virginia Hall had. Um, so, you know, I, I had access to the documents. And uh, so I wanted to uh, use some of my knowledge about spy tradecraft and, and uh, espionage to fill in the gaps and to tell a story that was a much more personal story than one that could come particularly just from documents. So, you know, to be honest with you, you know, uh, a lot of it had to do with, you know, my experience working with CIA to kind of fill in the blanks. And that's what I did. So Sarah, you, you didn't just write the script of, of the movie. You, you played you played Virginia. What, what, uh, talk a little about how that came about. Yeah. I mean, I always knew that I wanted to play Virginia. Um, you know, probably I would say halfway through the, the screenwriting process. Like she just spoke to me as someone who never takes the word no for an answer, which I loved. Um, absolutely loved and just was a woman ahead of her time. And so determined to make change whatever way she could see fit. Uh, much like Craig just said, I mean, I think the big challenge is exactly as an actress, what he just said, which is, you know, she didn't give interviews, you know, even when you talk to living relatives, um, getting inside the internal of a character uh, is impossible, you know, if you don't have those details. I think what helped me was some of the details her family gave her, gave me like, um, you know, wore a pirate 
bracelet, you know, was head of the basketball team or the pirate chief in plays like her, her chutzpah, so to speak. Um, even though that's not necessarily in the script gave me a sense of her personality. But at the end of the day, you really have to bring yourself to this role, which is why so many actresses could play Virginia in kind of so many authentic different ways, if that makes sense. Um, it, you know, in the, the, the Virginia Hall had a wooden leg nickname. She had nicknamed Cuthbert. Do you, either one of you know how she got the nickname Cuthbert? What, what's the story there? Sorry. I need it up in the script. I Googled <laughs> Cuthbert. So, so Craig, I'm curious your answer, but I Googled Cuthbert, St. Cuthbert. Right. And right. I found out that he was a soldier and a performer of miracles. And I thought that's kind of really interesting because she is this soldier. And I'm sure as a human being, we would all be praying you know, if we were in her circumstance to have her leg back, because that's the normal human thing to do um, when you lose something. So, so I have no idea. I, I, I Googled it too. And I came up with something very similar to that. But I also think that, you know, when I talked to the psychiatrist, he said, it's very important for people who have prosthetic limbs to, to, to personalize the limb a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that's why she gave it a name. Uh, so that she can swear at it when she's unhappy, you know, and, and all those other kinds of things that are that are important for people to kind of get the anger out of their system. Uh, but uh, like like Sarah said, I, I uh, kind of drew a blank as to why it was um, why it was Cuthbert. But uh, I think it was it's almost kind of like a, a playful name, perhaps. I don't know. At the time, I, I think that Cuthbert actually was kind of like a more common name, certainly then than it is now. But um, I, I agree with Sarah that it's it's probably rooted in something a little bit more uh, serious than just kind of a you know, off the off the cuff kind of you know nickname. Um, Sarah, you talked about how learning details from her family members helped you kind of put yourself in the right headspace to play her. Are there other things that you did to to prepare for this character, especially one who um, did did have a wooden limb and and you need to move differently? And how, how did you prepare for that? Yeah, well, um, in terms of getting into the mindset of, you know, 1941, as opposed to, you know, 2018, when we were shooting the movie, um, one of the one of the tricks that I would use in addition to just taking the time to put on the leg. So I had um, three variations of the leg for, for myself. I had um, an old prosthesis that we, the production design, like cut out holes and attached it to my leg and attached it to my back. Um, and that was very heavy. It was like, 12 pounds like they were um, and my back went out because it was on for so long for shooting. So then we modified it to styrofoam, et cetera. So putting on whatever, even if I wasn't on camera, even if I was just performing with my scene partner, I always had to have something on my leg just because again, as Craig mentioned, it is part of her now and it just helps me get into character. And then the other thing I would do is um, listen to Churchill's war speeches. And, you know, I only needed five minutes, but I would just put in my headphones. It tended to be the same one over and over again. And then you just automatically um, have a sense of time period, if that makes sense. And then in terms of kind of research, I did meet with um, some um, experts in these prostheses. For example, in the 30s and 40s, they were made for men. So it wouldn't have even fit Virginia. Like this is the type of detailed research you can do as an actress. And so, you know, everyone I spoke to said she would be in a lot of pain because her, her like stump would never fit. It would just kind of be like as if this was a glass going around all day long. So those kind of details helped um, get in character too. Like if you're in pain every day and you have to cover um, that kind of stuff. So the movie is filled with that kind of rich detail. Um, I was really struck by the scene where Virginia and one of her contacts in occupied France go out to lunch where food obviously was in short supply at the time. And in this restaurant, there's beautiful plates and crystal and silver, and the plate is filled with potatoes, um, which was such a lovely detail. I was wondering, actually, as they were walking to the restaurant, what's that going to be like? And then it was just so, so perfect that, you know, it, this it, every detail had been, had been fleshed out here. Can you talk a little bit more about how, I mean, it must be a laborious process to, to fill in all that historical detail. Yeah, I mean, the potatoes, and I'm glad you noticed that, like, that wasn't just like, you know, um, something that happened on set that was written into the scripts, very specifically what, what they ate. And I think, you know, when you're doing um, a low budget period film, you have to have every detail written into the script because you can't afford any mistakes. 
weeks because anything that kind of takes you out of that world, um, you know, from the water bottle sitting in the corner, all of a sudden you can't use that shot. So there, I did a lot of research about the world, like bringing the world into the movie. I mean, because really the stake for these characters, the stakes of the war is what drives, um, drives kind of the plot. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, can you hear me? My internet went a little unstable. Um, you broke up a little bit, oh. you're, but you're back. I think you're good now. So, so yeah, so there, there was a lot of that. Um, where are we in the war and how does that affect our characters? Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I, some of the, some of the, um, I'm sorry, I would love to hear a little bit more about Noor. That was such a fascinating character to me. And I, and I understand maybe those are two women whose lives didn't actually intersect um, that we know of in real life, but um, you chose to, to highlight her in the movie and she really was uh, such a compelling character. Can you speak a little bit more about her and, and why you decided to place her um, as, a, as a close uh, associate of Virginia Hall's? Sure. Um, yeah, so they did never meet. They were actually two years apart in the war and Nor went to Paris and, and Virginia was largely in like the Lyon area. Um, but they're actually really interesting in terms of putting together because you have the pacifist and the fighter and they're completely different worlds apart and yet they find different ways for their diversity to um, be a benefit to the missions that they're doing. So, so Noor as the wireless, she can still be a pacifist, right? Um, and she can still make a difference. And, and Virginia as the fighter can go ahead and, you know, lead explosions and, and make a difference. And I wanted to highlight why I put them together, not just because they were firsts, which I thought was cool, pioneers, but that highlight that our diversity can actually be an asset to the mission at hand. And that um, Vera Atkins, who was played by the wonderful Stan Akotic, uh, who came off as, it was such a sympathetic character in the movie. And so um, such an interesting representation as, as a Jewish woman in this position, even in England, an ally, how she was viewed with suspicion and distrust by, um, by the, the British command. Can you talk a little bit about her? Yeah. So, I mean, I love her character. She's um, widely considered kind of the real life inspiration for Miss Moneypenny in James Bond. If there are any um, James Bond fans out there. But yeah, Vera historically was Jewish and and she had to hide it within the SOE, within the own um, organization she was working for, which, you know, I found kind of disgusting. It was a kind of a, you know, I didn't know when I started researching the script um, that there was anti-Semitism in London at that time. Like it's not something that's necessarily, you know, taught in your history books. And I felt like, oh my gosh, that has to go in the film because it it, it did exist and it existed even though she was part of the allies. Um, and that's why she, part of why she didn't get her citizenship papers right away. But that was a tough role to cast too. And, and Stana does a fantastic job because she's not British really, right? So she's Romanian and she's pretending to be British. And so when you're casting kind of actresses, you know, three quarters of the American actresses aren't going to fit this role in terms of looking European and like, we didn't have money for like, you know, Dunkirk, pers- you know, we're not changing your face. <laughs> so like, you kind of have to come with it. But Stana is um, Serbian. And so she has kind of a European history and um, yeah, it, her, her appearance really worked well. Um, one of our, one of the folks in our chat has noted, you've mentioned a couple of times that it was the film didn't have a large budget. Um, one of our, our attendees has noted, and I com- agree completely, the film did not seem low budget. The, the location shots were so beautiful and sweeping. The costumes were wonderful. Um, you know, great actors. So just, uh, it, it was low budget. It, it's faking it really well. So um Congratulations. You. Um, you talked a little bit, uh, Craig, uh, Sarah had mentioned that um, Virginia's prison breaks uh, didn't really feature prominently in the movie, but they did in the book. Can you give us just a quick snapshot of one of these great stories that, that didn't make it into the movie? Sure. Um, actually, the, the prison break was, was um, what actually happened was that uh, uh, there were a bunch of people called the Corsicans who were, who came into uh, France from from the UK. They were supposed to be starting up sabotage operations throughout southern France. 
Uh, and what happened was that the, uh, the, the jump didn't go as, pro as expected. Uh, there, was, uh, there was one of the, uh, the Corsicans who actually had the, the uh, address of the safe house in his pocket. So once he was collected, uh, the Germans took over the safe house and all of the people and became what they call a mousetrap. All of the all of those people, the Corsicans, were rounded up eventually and lured into the safe house, which had become the German mousetrap. Uh, all of these people, for the most part, were then uh, kind of rounded up and uh, and sent to uh, Mozak prison. Uh, and it was Virginia Hall's responsibility in order to get these people out of there. Um, you know, uh, Sarah mentioned the Monopoly game. Uh, there were a variety of different kinds of ways to get the tools into um, into the prison. Uh, it was done kind of like in the dead of night. They had several uh, layers of barbed wire that they had to go under. They had to make sure they knew when the guards were coming around and when they had, uh, you know, the uh, proper amount of time so that they could uh, make a, a key and unlock the door and then kind of go underneath the barbed wire in order to escape but it was meticulously planned and it went off like clockwork. And it's one of the strange things about it was that there was a 13th member who actually escaped and uh, they, they didn't know, Virginia and everybody was wondering who this 13th person was. It was a prison guard. He wanted to get the hell out of Dodge. So he escaped with the rest of them as well. And, and uh, that's, that's kind of a thumbnail sketch of the story. Wow. Um, what are the things you mentioned James Bond movies early, Sarah, and how unsatisfying they are in portrayal of, of women. Um, but also they feature a very dramatic kind of, of image of a spy that's not really like realistic. And one of the things I thought about this movie was that it seemed so authentic to this painstaking, just almost tedious work. Can you talk a little bit about either one of you talk a little bit about what real spy tradecraft is like and how, how that um, manifests in, in the movie and the book compared to James Bond racing around in a cigarette boat, blowing things up and stealing nuclear launch codes. You Well, you you know, I did a panel with the CIA during the release, and, and actually one of the things they said was exactly what you mentioned, um, which is that, you know, for the most part, it's about the little things. And, and Craig, I'll let, I'll let you talk about this too, but it is, um, you know, looking the wrong way when you cross the street or having a piece of paper in your pocket or like, you know, in general, spying isn't necessarily doing what James Bond does, that big mission. Now, from a filmmaking standpoint, that was, again, another huge challenge because every most of your audience is used to seeing this one mission in a film you know you succeed saving private ryan there's your mission right and we didn't i mean yeah there's the war and winning the war but like that's not what these women were involved, were involved in on a smaller scale on the day by day on the setting of the explosive transmitting the message and how do you make that dramatic so so for me is the is this um and we're the main drama will they or won't they live like they have to human you're breaking up a little bit kind of oh uh, internet internet I, connection can you hear me yeah you've, your picture is frozen but we think we can hear you now i'm so you, sorry my internet seems to uh, you know yeah. I, in this crazy new world of zoom i think everyone has experienced okay. this uh before um so i yeah. Oh, and now we've got you moving and we can hear you. So you were saying, um, or you may be frozen again. You Let's get a Craig for a minute and then maybe. Uh, the, the, the thing about uh, espionage is that you have to be extremely disciplined in what you do. And now you also have to understand the culture in which you're operating. Now, the, the culture uh, Virginia knew very well in France uh, because uh, she, she went to school in, in uh, Grenoble and also um, in uh, Paris and, uh, and so forth. But she was dropped into an environment where, you know, if you, if you ride a bicycle and, and use two hands, and use one hand instead of two, if you order things uh, on the menu that haven't been seen for weeks, if you, uh, you know, smoke the wrong brand of cigarettes, you're automatically picked up by the Gestapo or picked up by the secret police. And so it's a very difficult kind of environment. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons certainly why Virginia was selected 
uh, for operating within the uh, Special Operations Executive and then later on with the OSS is because she understood uh, this milieu very, very well. Now, some of the other things that I was very impressed with with the movie was that, uh, Sarah, you had a very nice brush pass uh, with, the, uh, with the newspaper, uh, which, is, which is where you have a secret document in a, in a newspaper and you, you brush by somebody and you, they know it and they, they collect it and so forth. But it, it was, uh, it, these are the things, it's attention to detail and planning and planning and planning in order to make sure that agent meetings are successful that, uh, and so forth. You know, all these agent meetings for the most part uh, in which you're recruiting somebody have to be um, approved by headquarters and uh, you know what you're going to be talking about and all these different kinds of things. So attention to detail, especially when you're when you're involved in espionage is very, very important. Well, and also what 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 struck me is that the type of espionage they were doing wasn't, um, you know, get the nuclear launch codes or, or I mean, there were some pretty dramatic episodes like the prison break, but it was I uh, here are here is information about really little things that, that would then be added up by the analysts back in, in England. Exactly, exactly. And basically, um, you know, Virginia, uh, through her Heckler organization, was a hub uh, for the collection of intelligence information. At least this was primarily her responsibility um, in, the, in her first mission overseas. And she did it very well. Um, she originally went uh, there just to be eyes and ears, uh, to, to listen and collect information. But she uh, one of the hallmarks of Virginia Hall is that she, ex she exceeded her charter in so many different ways by creating uh, extensive networks of, of agents uh, who reported to her um, through dead drops and a variety of other kinds of things that, uh, you know, and, and actually the British and the Americans were kind of making up the spy game as they went along, but Virginia was a natural when it came to all these different kinds of things. So uh, she was just an, an amazing woman. Well, and, and, and in this extremely, this incredible danger, um, there were there were so many times in both the movie and the book where it was um, so clear that that you like you said, one person captured with an address in their pocket away from all of them being uh, tortured you know, horribly and, and murdered. Um, and that made me wonder about, you know, in the movie, there are some pretty intense torture scenes. How do you, as a writer, decide what you need to include to show the evil and brutality of the Nazis and the real danger the folks who are doing the spy work faced? And what's gratuitous? Like, how do you, how do you find that right balance? I love that question um, because I don't like gratuitous violence in anything. And I just want to point out that the movie is rated PG-13, which when we submitted it to the MPAA is very, very rare for a World War II movie. And that was a conscious choice of cutting it in a certain way so that ideally it can be used um, also as an education tool about these kind of hidden figures in the spy world with younger men and women um, in high school. So uh, when making the movie and in the script, I didn't want to, I don't like blood um, and I didn't want to show anything you've seen before. Uh, like I didn't want, but you know, you, like you said, you have to be authentic to the world. So, I mean, the most graphic we got like Noor's death is very stylized, but Dr. Chavan, her local contact, like that's not a comfortable scene to watch, um, you know, and, and we put his hands in boiling water because it was something that, you know, was a torture method used that I had never seen in a film. Like I wanted to find something new, um, but it was, it was a balance because you have to sense, if you don't sense the Nazis and the danger, then what are the stakes? What are they, you mm -hmm. have to have that. But I, but I just really don't like, violence for violence sake, which there's a lot of in film. Well, and one of the opening scenes of the movie is Virginia being trained how to withstand torture. And um, it's at least seems implied in the movie that she's not sure whether this is a training exercise or whether this is, she's really been seized by bad people. How do you, how, what was it like to film that scene? How do you, how do you so, you know, this is actually just, I mean, a, a funny story about low budget filmmaking. So I, I wore a wig, right, um, playing Virginia because it's faster and easier um, than, than you're doing your hair every day. And we could only afford two wigs because wigs with real hair are very, very expensive with the lace fronts. So 
I only got two takes to dunk the head into the water because we wouldn't have had time to take the wig out and dry it overnight and go back to the location and shoot again. So there was two takes for that. And we had two cameras and it was just like, you gotta go for it. Cause like, this is what you're gonna get. But um, you know, I mean, I'm trained in stage combat. It wasn't, it wasn't hard to shoot. I mean, you know, you have a bucket of water. They said, did you want it warm or cold? And I said, make it freezing. <laughs> you know? And then you're the one putting your head in and out. So, I mean, um, you know, um, it, it, it is what it, it is. What it is. Oh. Um, why did you choose to end the movie with Virginia's return, her second trip to France? Well, we had, with all my movies, the script has a different ending than actually the final cut that I have of the film. You know, it's just part of the process of you write a script, you shoot the script, and in the edit room, things evolve. So so the ending in the original script was actually like a team of Jedberg, t- uh, of three people blowing up some big thing to prove that this these smaller teams, these smaller teams of SOE and OSS officers were highly efficient. And the last shot was Virginia on the wires, like Noor, right? So it was mm-hmm. going to echo kind of Noor. Um, and that kind of she was taking over um, Noor's job. It just, it sounded great. It read great. It didn't play great. And, te- you know, for whatever reason, we didn't get the shot, you know, with low budget filming, sometimes you don't get the shots. And we, we, we got them, but audiences didn't get it, didn't respond. So, so we had to find a new ending. So that's where, but I liked the concept of going back, like, okay, that mission's done. And now we got D-Day and we have to go back and here we go again, which is really kind of life, right? You hit one mountain and now you got to start over and go to the next mountain. The, the viewer may not be seeing it, but we know Virginia's still out there doing her thing. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. yeah. So Craig, your book continues after the movie ends. Right. Um, can you talk a little bit about Virginia's life, uh, you know, after, after the, the curtain falls on the movie, but also about her life after World War II? Uh, sure. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about Virginia after after uh, after the OSS. Um, she joined the CIA, and first of all, she she refused a, uh, a the Distinguished Service Cross from uh, from President Truman because she wanted to continue her work in espionage, and she she felt that uh, her cover would be blown if, in fact, she had a you know the, the award from uh, from President Truman. So so she had the award, uh, and she'd been highly decorated uh, from a variety. The Brits gave her member of the British Empire and a whole bunch of other different kinds of awards. The French gave her the Croix de Guerre. Um, but uh, so she had all of this different kinds of experience, and yet she still wanted to contribute. Uh, so she joined the CIA in 1951, but unfortunately, it wasn't really a happy experience for her because. Um, she, she had a, a number of different kinds of experiences that things were changing. The world was changing a little bit. Uh, people, she had much more experience than a number of the people in the agency. And yet this is part of the discrimination thing. Um, you know, they, they didn't want uh, women to be in senior positions. There was a lot of institutionalized discrimination in the CIA uh, back at that time. Uh, in fact, uh, Virginia was one of the first women uh, to be a case officer in the CIA. A case officer is, is a handler of spies. Um, uh, and uh, she, was, she was brought in at, at uh, I believe, the GS-12 level. GS-14 is highest, uh, as high as women were allowed to go. Uh, men could rise to the level of GS-17, which is kind of a super grade. So automatically, there was institutionalized discrimination against uh, women. Uh, there was something called the Petticoat Panel, uh, which in the 1950s was a study from in CIA about whether, in fact, you know, what the future role of women should be at CIA, which was really kind of a, a forward-looking kind of document. But they came up with all of the wrong conclusions, like men didn't want women to be their supervisors, and men had to be, you know, the breadwinners in the of the of the house. So there should be financially more. Uh, you know, more secure and have higher positions, it came to all the wrong conclusions. Uh, so, you know, Virginia was not really happy in that kind of a situation. Uh, and uh, eventually she retired on, on disability. Part of the reason why she wasn't really happy either is that in the CIA, you get promoted by being overseas and, mm-hmm. you know, in, in the thick of it in, in uh, behind the Iron Curtain and, and back then behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, but she stayed mostly uh, in the uh, in the agency itself at headquarters building in Langley, 
And uh, that wasn't really good for her career either. Uh, the, the agency really didn't know what to do with Virginia. And unfortunately, uh, her, her, all of her talents and abilities were squandered. Uh, I tend to think that she would have been brilliant as, as uh, you know, in a, certainly in a leadership position, training new agents, doing things that took advantage of the kinds of skills and abilities that she had. But it really wasn't a happy time for her. And she um, eventually retired on disability uh, in, in about 1965 or 66, I believe. Okay, um, and had married a man who she met while on the ground in France. So she did have a, she did have a happy ending as a, with a happy, a happy love story. Exactly right. Uh, Paul Guyot um, was was one of the uh, OSS people who jumped into um, uh, part of the Jedburgh team that jumped into southern France, uh, just as Virginia had already kind of cleaned out the the Hot Loire area, uh, the Jedbergs were kind of uh, kind of little Johnny come lately in, in, the, in the situation, but she met uh, Paul and uh, eventually they got married much to the disappointment of her mother uh, because nobody was good enough to marry her daughter. And uh, that, was, that was one of the, one of the uh, kind of continuing issues with, with Virginia, but they had a, they had a happy marriage and, uh, and uh, lived on a farm where uh, Paul was able to grow his vegetables, he was a gourmet cook. And Virginia, uh, there are pictures of Virginia with, with oodles of poodles. She loved French poodles. Mm. And uh, that, was, that was kind of her, uh, her love too. So uh, they enjoyed a happy life uh, after the agency. Well, and we didn't get to meet Paul in the movie, which I actually thought was great. Um, it's sometimes, sometimes, it seems like they were pretty busy big spies. And I, I love, I, I don't like it when movies try to shoehorn in a romantic plot that clearly doesn't belong. So I thought it was, uh, it was refreshing to see a movie that was able to focus on women's actions without um, inserting a, which is what I would expect from a female filmmaker. So thank you. Um, we're going to take some questions from the audience now. We have a lot of questions that have come in and we're probably not going to have time to get to all of them, but we'll go through as many as we can. Um, someone is asking, um, how long was Noor imprisoned at Dachau and did Vera actually notify her family of her death? So I'd have to go back to the research. I think it was like six months that she was in prison. Um, I mean, she was missing. Nobody knew what happened to her. It was after the war that, um, they found out that she was shot. She did, uh, try and escape twice by reports, which is something that I put in the script and movie and felt was important to her legacy that, you know, some girl that the report said originally was a doll and not a fighter and blah, 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 up until the end was very heroic and did fight and did try to get out of there. Um, and did, and no, didn't crack and apparently didn't, didn't cr crack. Many of the men cracked, you know, she was interrogated um, by all accounts, didn't, didn't give any information. The, the scene with the mother I made up, um, so there's that, that did not happen. Um, you know, Vera did not notify her mother with Virginia. Um, well, there was not, there was not a dry in this house during that scene. So um, good addition, I'm going to say it really I the history. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you know, it, it did give that flip side of, of the human, the human piece of loss that, that we saw that we saw the risk and danger to the people in the field, but then that, that uh, despair and sadness of the folks left at home. I thought it was beautiful. So, so Craig, you were going to add something. Yeah, one of the things that I really liked about the film too, was that during that scene with Noor at the end, um, her last word was liberté, and that is that is actually uh, uh, documented. Uh, so it was, uh, I thought, a very poignant part of the uh, of the movie. Yeah, I I thought yeah I thought that was uh, um it it fits so seamlessly together. I was surprised to realize that she was not actually a part of the contiguously part of the story. It was really a, I thought a great. Uh, triad of the of the three female characters. Um, another viewer asks, um, Craig, did your past with the CIA help you gain access about to information about Virginia Hall? Uh, I gained access to information Virginia Hall that was uh, publicly available uh, through okay. NARA. Uh, so um, I actually, but the thing is, it, it's not just the public information. I, I uh, talk to people about spy tradecraft and a variety of other kinds of things. So I didn't have any special access that other people don't have. Uh, but what was interesting at the time, I was also involved in document declassification. That was part of my uh, consulting work. So I did have, uh, I did have access to 
directly to the uh, to the files that were uh, were given to NARA. And the, you did uh, hike the Pyrenees, which I don't know anyone oh, else has done. <laughs> Let's like not forget about that, Craig. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. Uh, that was uh, wow. that was one of the fun adventures. Uh, actually, I was challenged by one of my professors to to find Virginia Hall's trail. Nobody knew where it was. Uh, so um, armed with two paragraphs from a French book that was written long ago that I and I didn't read French. Uh, I went and uh, and uh, with my wife, who does speak French, uh, was able to uh, go to the, the location and nobody knew where it was. And I had to go to visitor centers and I went to the Jerome's uh, Freedom uh, Trail Museum and all these different kinds of places. It was it was kind of a kind of a mess. But eventually they said, you know something, there is a trail and it's very steep, but be careful, it's at the edge of town of Villafrance de Conflet. And that's what I went and found the, found the trail with my wife, it was great. But, you know, constantly a viewer is asking how many miles um, was Virginia's trip to the mountains and how many days or hours would it have sure. taken her to make that? It was three days over 50 miles in snow and ice. And I can just imagine what it was like dragging her prosthetic limb over all the uh, over all the mountains and through the valleys and and so forth, um, you know. Uh, one of the interesting stories is that after Virginia climbed the mountains, you know, she she thought that uh, she'd be going to San Juan de la Besa's trail uh, rain uh, excuse me train station, and she was there. She got there early, which basically is a, is a no no for espionage. I mean, spies never arrive early to an appointment. But she was there for two hours prior to the time, and uh, there were policemen there uh, who checked her passport and saw that she didn't have an entrance stamp into Spain. So she was arrested for, uh, for border violation, and she was thrown into Spanish jail for six weeks so, uh, until, the, uh, until the U.S. consulate came and pulled her out. So it was, it was quite, a, quite an ordeal for her, and for her to want to go back Mm -hmm. After Klaus Barbie chasing her, after this amazing trek over the Pyrenees, is just unbelievable. Just unbelievable. Um, it, it is. I was thinking some nights I feel too tired to walk up the stairs to bed. So I can only imagine, uh, I can't imagine <laughs> crossing the Pyrenees in the snow with a prosthetic limb. Yeah. Um, so one of our viewers says, a notes that a number of books have been published in the last several years regarding the role of spies, particularly women in France and Germany. This viewer is wondering um, whether it would, these novels have been made possible by the discovery or opening of archival records, or is this just random chance that this has become a popular topic? I think it's some of each, personally. What do you think, Craig? I, I think that uh, it, the time has come. I think that, that uh, uh, some of the government, you know, there are peaks and troughs of, of, in terms of the release of, of documents from the government. You know, during COVID now, no, nothing's basically been released because there's nobody kind of uh, working, working the documentation. But I think certainly the time has come. Time is right for, for women's stories. People are hungry for understanding uh, the diversity and the great diversity that we have uh, in, in the world of espionage. And uh, certainly, uh, women heroes in the in the World War II and, and Cold War era too are are really coming to the fore and should be. And I would actually flip it on an interesting note, which is how many stories do we see about men on World War II and we don't even question them? Do you know what I mean? Like every every month, there's a new World War II story about a, a male version. So I think there's plenty of room for all these women's stories to see the light of day. Um, Cause it's not, I hear a lot of the time as like a, a female filmmaker, like, you know, oh, that would be repetitive because of this or that or that, but, but it's not repetitive because these women's stories have never been told before and there's room for all of them. Yeah. Um, one of our attendees asks, why were some spies sent to prison and others to concentration camps? You may take a stab. I have no idea. That's outside of my pay grade. <laughs> I think I think the the agents from the SOE and from OSS, if they were captured, uh, they were tortured and then sent to, uh, to sent to concentration camps because of the kinds of knowledge that they had and the background that they had. Um, I think that that some of the collaborators might have been sent to nearby prisons. Uh, 
you know, I think it was it was the degree of culpability. I think that that and some some people, if they were spies, you know, they were just kind of shot on sight. So it's it's a kind of a grade, a kind of a gray area as to who went where. Um, but I think it also had something to do with the uh, the, the degree of culpability and and uh, the level of espionage as to how exactly they wanted to uh, uh, punish punish people. Okay. Um, one of our attendees notes that at the end of the movie, it was stated that one out of three female spies died at the hands of Nazis. And this attendee wants to know, did that ratio improve as the British and Americans became more experienced? You know, honestly, I, I don't know. I mean, I didn't research when, you know, I think that the numbers, some said it was 38, 39, 40 that died, like the, all the records of that. And then my top SOE experts said it was 39 and 13 died, one went missing. Like, in other words, the records are all over the place. So you just have to like do all your research. But in terms of when, I, I don't know. I don't know the ratio. Do you, Craig? Yeah, I, I think actually uh, women and men almost died at, at comparable ratios. Um, actually, the OSS was a Johnny Come Lately uh, in the in the world of espionage. So, um, you know, one of the reasons why they selected Virginia was because of her knowledge of of uh, you know the the, the the terrain, the culture, uh, the language, all those kinds of things. And this was just before the D-Day invasion, and and the OSS only had like three people on the ground at that time. So, um, uh, the British really kind of were the the people who had an understanding of tradecraft. And it probably got a little bit better, uh, but they still were making a lot of mistakes. Uh, the sending people into areas where uh, the Germans controlled the radio and were feeding back to the Brits uh, information on where they could land their people so they could round them up. I mean, it, was, it wasn't a really good situation. It was kind of like a, a messy war situation. I'm not sure the Brits improved all that much, but the Americans were really kind of late into the, into the war. Okay. Um, we have time for two more questions. So um, one of our attendees asks that she's read it that, that at the end of the war, Charles de Gaulle did not want to share credit and unceremoniously kicked out the American and British spies, even threatening them with arrest. And she wants to know if that's correct. We didn't, we didn't have a great relationship with de Gaulle all the way through. And a lot of people didn't necessarily want de Gaulle to go into Paris uh, to, to liberate it. Um, <clears throat> Uh, go well, what's actually what's interesting is that one of uh, Virginia's um, some of Virginia's actual uh, agents who were who were working for the SOE. Um, one of the reasons why Virginia, let me take a step back. One of the reasons why Virginia went back after the war was over, she went back to, after the war was over to check in, check in on all of her agents to make sure that they were OK. Uh, a lot of them had been in, uh, wearing sackcloth and, and were, were in uh, concentration camps and so forth. But one of the, one of the strange things was that uh, the French didn't uh, do anything to offer restitution for any of her French uh, agents. Uh, and they were, uh, so Virginia took it upon herself in order to uh, find restitution and, and get restitutions through the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. So the Gaul was a little bit strange when it came to, um, you know, honoring his own people who were supporting the war effort. Um, that's as, that's about as far as I I can go with that, unfortunately. Okay. And our last question, um, one of our attendees asks, Sarah, with the Me Too movement, is funding for these types of movies easier to get? No. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I mean, I can totally um, uh, say more, but it's, it's incredibly hard to fund a, a feature film. My last film, Equity, made a profit at Sundance, and it was still um, incredibly hard to fundraise for this film. And I'm forever grateful um, to the many, many investors who did invest in this film um, because, you know, you don't get to make independent films without your, your investors, but it's always a challenge. It, it doesn't get easier. Well, that's a, um, I was hoping to have a more triumphant note to it. <laughs> but you know, the truth is the truth. And that's something that, I mean, I think everyone who is interested in this film and this story would like to know and figure out how to go, you know, promote. Well, I think I can like very quickly say that like, you know, some of the pushback I would get would be, um, you know, well, it's a World War II movie. We don't, World War II movies, nobody wants to watch them anymore. Um, but but if it was Tom Hanks and then you then I wouldn't have gotten the same feedback. Someone so, tell 
someone tell 1917 and Dunkirk that nobody wanted to watch them. So yeah, I'm oh, sorry, 1917 would be about World War I, right? I'm on the ball tonight, I promise. Um, anyway, um, so I think we are pretty much uh, out of time here and I'm going to hand this back to Sarah Saltzman from the Holocaust Center. But I just wanted to say thank you so much. This has been, um, I enjoyed the book. I enjoyed the movie. I really loved getting the opportunity to talk to both of you about them. And I encourage everyone here, if you haven't seen the movie or read the book, go do it immediately. You just give yourself the gift of, of getting to know these characters. And, and this is just a great, uh, just two great, very different, equally great approaches to the material. And thank you for, uh, for this conversation. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Sarah, for having me moderate this panel. Uh, Nancy, you were wonderful. And I wanna thank Sarah and Craig for your time. It was such an interesting discussion. Um, for everyone <clears throat> watching, please note that a call to spy is now available exclusively on Showtime. So if you haven't already seen the movie, please watch it. And we would like to say a special thank you to Tamar Simon and IFC Films who helped us arrange this evening's program. We really appreciate it, Tamar. If you're interested in reading more about the fascinating women discussed tonight, we have books available through www.holocaustcenter.org. Um, check out our website. And I would like to mention that our next event at the Holocaust Memorial Center is on March 15th. It will feature Dr. Lori Weintraub, and she will talk about the thousands of women who fought with defiance and dignity to save themselves and others in Nazi-occupied Germany. To learn more about this and our other programs, go to our website at holocaustcenter.org we thank you so much for joining us tonight, and I wish you all a good evening.